Hmm. Yeah, I just wanted to um, remind us, um, a reading from Matthew chapter 4 and verse 19, right? Matthew 4 and verse 19. Um, were the words of the Lord Jesus. Like, then he said to them, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Right? Follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Um, the words of the Lord Jesus and he's talking to Simon Peter, Andrew, his brother. And uh, the Bible also talks about the kind of response uh, to these words. Right? But um, the important thing is this, you know, um, that the Lord Jesus said, you follow me and I will, and I will make you. Right? Uh, what is he making you as we follow? He's making them somebody who will lead others, who will lead others to follow Christ. And to he that he will make them to be leaders who will lead other people, who will help others in following Christ. And he says, I will make you fishers of men. And in fact, uh, last class we we learned about uh, you know how each of us, all of us, um, you know, we are influencers, or we are uh, the Lord has placed us um, as as leaders in our realms of um uh, in our realms fear of influence right so so the key thing is this that we follow him and as we follow him he is making us there is something he's fashioning us um to be uh, leaders who will lead others to follow him right? it's very important so uh, our following is crucial um, I would say, you know, critical to us being fashioned uh, to be leaders. And our following Jesus is crucial to us being fashioned as leaders who would lead others to follow Jesus. So, so let's pray and and say, God, you know, whatever it takes, you know, whatever needs to be done uh, on my part, on our part, uh, to be followers, to be such followers. Uh, who would be fashioned, who would be shaped by you to lead others. We want to be that, right? So let's uh, let's pray. Father God, we, we thank you for this day, Lord, even as we uh, just come before you. Lord, we thank you that as we follow you, you are making us, fashioning us, changing us, Lord, and shaping us, Lord, to be the ones who would lead others, the ones who would disciple others, Lord, to follow you, God. For you said, Lord, to go into the world, to preach the gospel, and to teach others, to observe, Lord, all the things that you have taught us. And so, God, as we follow you, Lord, as your sons and daughters, as we follow you, God, we thank you that you are making us. And to even today, Lord, I pray that you would, that you would make us, that you would fashion us, Lord, that you would change us, Lord, to be people, Lord, who would represent you, Lord, who would draw others to you, Jesus, and make us into such people. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay. So, um, yeah, so last class we started with uh, leadership, uh, Christian leadership, and we looked at some concepts uh, um, and the definition, rather, definition and description of who a leader is, right? And we also looked at, um, you know, how when we consider Jesus, uh, what are the lessons that we can learn? And we looked at about four of them, um, how um, as a leader, we need to know our purpose, and that will really help us uh, no matter what we go through. We will stay the course when we know this is the purpose and we will not be deterred from it and that we see in the life of Jesus. And as leaders, we need to be selfless the way the Lord was and uh, he came to serve and not to be served. Right? So we see that, uh, that aspect of leadership that the Lord Jesus brought in. And, um, and we also saw that uh, we need to be obedient. He was obedient to the Father. So we need to be obedient as well. Um, and the fourth thing we saw was that as a leader, 
that we are here to serve others. You know, this is closely in line with the fact that we uh, we have come to serve. Uh, we have come to be selfless as leaders. Um, the Lord Jesus, he was a servant to all. He was a leader, and in fact, uh, we saw in Matthew chapter twenty how he says that, you know, you call me Lord, and it is it is right, right? But then, um, you even as I have done this, you need to do to others. So the Lord Jesus set an example of humility, of servant leadership, uh, which we ought to emulate and follow. Okay. So the thing is, um, you know, he said very very clearly in Matthew chapter 20 that uh, um, this is how the world's style of leadership is. You know, he, make, he made a difference. He said, this is how the world's style of leadership is, but it shall not be so uh, among you. So it's very, very, um, it's very tempting. It's, um, you know, we are drawn to the world's style of leadership. Now, I'm not saying that, uh, you know, everything about the world's style of leadership, everything that we, you know, the books that we read generally on leadership, on management, and and uh, and all that is um, is bad. No, there's a lot of wisdom there. There's a lot of truth there um, that we can actually, you know, we can follow. We can put to practice in our lives something, things that are valuable. But at the same time, you know, in practice, you know, when we when we are in, uh, uh, let's say. Uh, uh, in a corporate setting, maybe you're working for an organization, and you know you may not see that kind of an example in in leaders who are above us, right? And and that's and so the the thing is to follow that in order to get the work done, to intimidate in order to get the work done, right? Uh, to be as authoritarian as possible to get the work done to threaten in order to get the work done. But the Lord says, no, it shall not be so among you, which means that there is another way of leading. And that is what the Lord wants for us as leaders who are who follow him, right? So um, so as much as you know, it might be uh, attractive, you might say, OK, that gets the job done, uh, that keeps people in check. Uh, that gives a self, I mean, uh, gives oneself a sense of uh, control and, and so on. Um, it is not, you know, the Lord's uh, desire, right? Uh, and in the long run, you know, we see that in the long run, it does not benefit. It does not benefit the situation, it does not benefit the people. It does, it does not benefit, definitely does not benefit the leader himself or herself, right? So, so to be a servant leader, so that's where we stopped last class. So this class uh, today, uh, let's look at, uh, let's follow, um, you know, follow through, and let me just present um, the notes. Mm. Okay. Right. Okay. So, as a as a leader, um, the other big aspect of leadership, which we see in the life of lead uh, of the Lord Jesus, is that of sacrifice. Okay. Is that of sacrifice? So, what is sacrifice? You know, sacrifice could mean two things. Right. One is uh, it means to give up certain things, right? It could be giving up, or it could mean to take on, okay? To give up certain things that are maybe comforts, rights, privileges, right? things that are legitimately yours, legitimately mine. Now, this is, I have a right to this. You know, this is mine. I have a right to enjoy this I have comfort, privileges, and so on. But sacrifice would mean to give up that for the sake of, uh, of the, of the, you know, for the sake of getting the job done, for the sake of leading the people, for the sake of, you know, if you look at the big picture, for the sake of Christ, right? Um, so a, a, a sacrifice in that front. So as a leader, 
we see, you know, uh, uh, if we look at the life of Jesus, I and mean, we read in Hebrews that he, uh, this is what he did. And Hebrews 2, 2 and verse, um, verses 10 to 11, let's read that. Um, As it was fitting for him, for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing, bringing many sons to glory, okay, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings for both he who sacrifices and those who are being sanct uh, sorry he who uh, sanctifies and those who are being sanctified are all of one for which reason he's not ashamed to call them brethren let's look at verse 10 it says that you know for whom are all things and by whom are all things right in bring, bringing many sons to glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings right um so which means that uh, it's talking about the father it's talking about the son who was who went through those sufferings some things that uh, you know he had a right to but he just did not walk in it right he gave it up he gave himself up right and um, so it says that uh, this is what he did hebrews chapter 5 it says uh, it talks about the Lord Jesus again, who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with vehement cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death, but was heard because of his godly fear. Though he was a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. And having been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation to those who obey him. Right? The kind of life that he lived, the kind of sacrifice right, uh, that he made. So uh, our sacrifice is nothing compared to you know, whatever the Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus did. Our sacrifice is nothing. So when we look at sacrifice, it's not a grudging thing. It's not uh, saying that, oh, you know, our attitude is that, okay, I'm, I'm willingly giving up certain things, certain rights, privileges, certain comforts. Willingly, joyfully giving up in order to be a leader. Right? Um, sacrifice also means the other part of it is to take on, to take on certain things, maybe responsibilities, maybe tasks, maybe certain um, certain things that need to be done. Uh, it also means to take on certain things. Right? It's not just giving up, but also to take on. Actually, in taking on, um, we are actually giving up a few things. Right? Maybe um, the freedom to, or maybe the time uh, to do certain other things. Should we give that up because we have taken on this responsibility? Maybe. Um, so, uh, as a leader, we need to be acquainted um, with sacrifice. Okay, so um, so it doesn't mean that uh, you know, as leaders, we we cannot enjoy or we cannot uh, you know as as believers, as leaders, um, that we cannot really truly enjoy life to its, you know, the abundant life that he came to give. No, but this sacrifice is is a part of it. It's an aspect. It's an, a very important aspect of it. So the sooner we kind of embrace that truth, I right, say, okay, it's going to be this is going to be part of me, and I'm not going to. I'm going to be comfortable with it. In the sense, I'm going to be comfortable with the truth, with the fact that there will be sacrifices, and I need to make sacrifices. Right? Then, the sooner we do that, the sooner we come to terms with it. Um, you know, we we will actually be able to focus on the job, uh, focus on the responsibility, the ministry, everything, and joyfully, knowing that yes, this is part of it. Otherwise, it's going to be a big struggle. Right? We are going to be always asking that question: Why me? Why me? And we 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 might even you know compare, look at other uh, other leaders and say they have it easy, I have it difficult, or look at the other person, or the other people whom I'm leading, they have it easy, I have it difficult. Right? We're going to be constantly doing that, right? But um, the sooner we come to terms with this, meaning come to terms, meaning that okay, you understand, you accept, and uh, you say okay. If the when the opportunity comes uh, that I need to you know, 
take on certain things or give up certain things. We just do it. Okay. Um, so that's uh, one aspect of leadership that we see in the life of Jesus. Okay. One more is that um, as a leader, we are called to be examples. Okay. We are called to be examples. So as a leader, the idea is not that we are just giving information, giving advice, being visionaries, uh, solving problems or suggesting solutions, uh, you know, uh, leading the team, directing the team, maybe correcting. It's, it's, it's all that is there. But first and foremost, we set an example. We set an example through our life, through our speech, through our action, everything. We set an example. And, uh, you know, Paul in his instruction to Timothy, uh, let me just read that. Um, um, Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse, verse 12. Um, so this is uh, what he writes to Timothy. He says, let no one despise your youth, but be an example to the believers. And he writes, he writes a few things there, right? In word, in conduct, in love, in spirit, in faith, in purity, right? So it says, uh, in all these things, be an example. Example to who? To the people whom we are leading. Now, he's a young person. He's a young leader. And he's leading people who are younger than him. He's leading people who are older than him. And so uh, Paul says, you know, let no one despise your youth. You know, if you do this, they're not going to look down on you or look down on the fact that you're a young person if you lead by example. If your life is an example to them, then, you know, they will follow, right? Um, so he's saying, you model this kind of life, okay? So let, let's look at, um, you know, if you look at John chapter 13 and verse 12 to 15, the Lord Jesus, he not only uh, spoke about servant leadership, but he also modeled it, right? It says uh, in verse 12, so when he had washed their feet, taken his garments and sat down again, he said to them, do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, you say, well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord, and teacher have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Right. So he led by example. He led, uh, he practiced it, he showed it, he demonstrated it um, through that one instance and also throughout his earthly ministry. Right. So he led by example. And, uh, you know, uh, just think about it. He's, uh, you know, ministering to uh, a whole lot of people. Uh, he knows that, uh, uh, he knows that, yes, uh, here, he, he knows the hearts of people. He knows their thoughts. Um, just imagine, you know, as he was washing Judas's feet, uh, he knows what's going on in Judas's life. He knows his thoughts. Because over and over again, we see that, uh, you know, the word of knowledge and the word of wisdom, prophecy was you know, by the Spirit. Uh, it was working in his life, right? He looked at Nathaniel and said, here's a man without guile, and, and so on. He knew what was in people's hands. So as he was washing Judas's feet and, uh, and just imagining, you know, his feet uh, dirty and with dust and all that, and he's pouring water and he's just washing and and he knows this is this is the person you know who's soon after he's going to do something against him. Okay. Uh, he's going to he's going to betray for money the uh, one for whom he you know the one whose feet he's washing, right? And yet he. He did it. Yet he did it. As he was washing Peter's feet, yeah, uh, probably he, you know, even at that time, the uh, Spirit of God would have prompted him, and uh, this is what, because he told Peter that you will deny, you will deny me thrice before the rooster crows, right? So he's washing, and then, and Peter's just saying, God, 
you know, you, you say, not my, not my feet, you will not wash my feet. But the Lord says, okay, no, I need to wash your feet. You know? uh, and, uh, and we know that conversation that happened, and he's, Peter's saying, Lord, you wash my, not wash my entire self, not my feet only, but my entire self. Uh, and uh, and he's washing his feet, and he knows what he's going to say. He's going to say, I don't know this man. I, I don't know this Jesus. But yet he washed. Right? So, uh, you know, this is a very high level of leadership. It's a very high level of leadership. A leadership that literally impacts people and, uh, you know, maybe on the face of it, it might seem like it might seem like oh this is a this is a losing strategy like it's a losing strategy what will you gain out of it some some people are getting the upper hand some people are gaining the upper hand it's a losing strategy like even though it, on the face of it it might look like that but it's a transforming life changing uh, style of leadership right a way of living that the lord brought in he says you do this serve one another right? if you want to be great you be the servant and in doing so right, you will be great in the eyes of the father so um so that is what you know he brought in and um, uh, luke chapter 15 talks about persecution and uh, how the response of the world irrespective of the response of the world go ahead and do what you need to do serve how you need to serve right? Luke 15 verse 18 if the world hates you you know that it hated me before it hated you if you were of the world the world would love its own yet because you are not of the world but I chose you out of the world therefore the world hates you remember the word that I said to you a servant is not greater than his master if they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. So, so this serving is uh, not only when things are good, not only when things are ideal. Um, the serving is even when things um, things are not good, right? Even when things are hostile. Even when things are going our way, not going our way, um, so that's an that's an important lesson because uh, uh, you know when you, when you look at humility, when you look at serving, uh, it's easier to be humble before people who are who are humble. Right? It's easier to serve others who are nice to us, uh, who say thank you and appreciate what we're doing and acknowledge what we're doing. You know. Who are, so gracious to uh, to come back and thank and it's easy it's nice it's comfortable but it's un uncomfortable and it's uh, it it is difficult when you serve others who who maybe do not even acknowledge uh, who maybe do not appreciate right and uh, there's no there's no one around to appreciate and say wow wonderful good job um, it's uh, it's it's difficult in such circumstances. That's at one level. At another level, it's like when people whom you serve, uh, the very people whom we serve, turn around and persecute. Turn around and and when we say okay, it's a persecution, you know, it, it ranges from maybe just ridicule to. Imprisonment, maybe uh, it ranges, right? It's a wide range of things that could happen in persecution. It could be in a family setting, it could be among friends, it could be in, a, you know, in an office environment, it could be in a ministry and a church and whatever, right? But this is the example that we have that, uh, set by the Lord, right? So, uh, having said that, I also want to add that uh, you know we need to be discerning and do it in the right way. Of course, we're going to talk about that, you know, about team and about uh, uh, about team dynamics and interaction with others and so on. So, um, it, it, should, it needs to be done in the right way, right? When we serve, when we uh, 
we do this it needs to be right, done in the right way uh, even when we love people when we say you know we love people unconditionally um it has to be with truth right it is uh which means truth is spoken truth is demonstrated uh and there are times when we we need to you know it it involves bringing forth correction uh, and so on right so we we will uh probably look at that when it comes to um, teams and working with people and so on okay so um yeah so this is um this is uh, quite important right serving irrespective of the response okay um okay lastly uh, i'm sure there are many things that we can actually uh, draw from the life and the ministry of the lord jesus um one thing that we see is that he trusted the team right um he forgave he gave them an, another chance he trusted encouraged them right. so, uh, luke chapter 10 verse 1 after these things the lord appointed 70 others also first he sent the 12 then you know then we have 70 others send them two by two uh, into every city and every place uh, where he himself was about to go so he's just delegating uh, commissioning them saying okay this is what you need to do enter into every city you know go heal the sick um, raise the dead and preach the good news of the kingdom and they go right and they saw wonderful things they saw the fruit of uh, you know the the ministry the power of uh, the power of the spirit operational as they obeyed the lord right they saw that uh, and they came back rejoicing. They said, wow, even the demons are subject, right? And the very same people deserted the Lord. The very same people ran, ran away. And, uh, and the Lord Jesus did not kind of disqualify them immediately, right? He gave them another, another chance. He forgave. Luke chapter 24, you know, we, we go back, uh, we go to that uh, uh, that chapter, and then we see that, uh, yeah, the Lord has actually, you know, called them, restored them, and uh, recommissioned them uh, into, uh, into the purposes of the kingdom. Recommissioned them, it says. Luke chapter 24, like, uh, and uh, we read from verse 47, 48, and 49 talks about the how he's sending the promise of the Father, the Holy Spirit upon them, and so on, right? 47 and 48, and then that rapid repentance and remission of uh, sins to be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem, and you are the witnesses of these things, he says, and he sends them out. Um, so, so this is something that he did. So, uh, and in that group, of course, there was Peter, who had denied him, and uh, the, the Lord's conversation with Peter, we find it in John chapter 21, and uh, the Lord speaking to Peter, the Lord asking him thrice, um, Peter, do you love me? And, uh, and then the Lord saying, uh, Peter is responding, yes, Lord, I do, and, uh, and the Lord saying, feed my sheep. Tend my sheep, feed my lambs, feed my sheep. So um, the Lord restoring that ministry to Peter, that uh, you know, the, the task, the responsibility to Peter. Peter, the Lord knew that there was something in Peter. You know, he calls him you know, you know, on that, that revelation. You are Jesus, the son of the living God. Uh, and then on that revelation, the Lord Jesus said, on this rock, I will build my church. And even though at that time it seemed like everything was scattered, everything was this whole thing of this commission, this plan, and everything was completely destroyed, the Lord restores it back, you know, uh, reaffirms, forgives, reaffirms, and entrusts with this great responsibility of uh, of changing the world. Right? Uh, it's it's amazing how uh, the Lord would do it. Um, and so he, when we look at the Lord and we look at uh, the uh, example that he said, we see that, okay, this is something that is for us as well, right? Um, we cannot uh, write out, we cannot uh, rule out 
somebody, we can always extend grace. Okay, you can always extend grace. So, uh, so the Lord's question, you know, if we, it's interesting when we consider John chapter 20, 21, sorry, John chapter 20, yeah, John chapter 21. Um, so we see, uh, I'll, I'll just come back to that question, Divya, uh, your question. Uh, I see that. So, um, so the Lord is asking Peter, you know, God, do you, do you love me? And then the word that he uses is agape. Okay. And Peter, when he responds, he says, uh, Lord, I phileo, which means friendship, how you would love a brother. Like, you know that I love you. The Lord is asking, do you agap, agapao me? You know, do you love me with that, with that unconditional God kind of love? The second time also, you know, he asks that same question. Uh, second time, sorry, he, he asks in, in verse 17, John chapter 21, verse 17, uh, uh, he uh, verse 16, he asks, uh, do you love me? Right? The second time he asks, uh, agapao, you know, do you love me? And uh, and Peter says, Lord, you know that I phileo, you know, that, that friendship kind of love, uh, I'm fond of you. Right. And then again, the Lord says, okay, feed my sheep. The third time, he asks uh, the question, do you phileo me? You know, he changes it now. From agape, he says, you know, do you phileo? You know, are you fond of me? Do you love me? He just comes down to you know, Peter's uh, level. And he asks, you know, do you do this? Uh, and uh, Simon Peter responds, "Yes, Lord, I do." Um, and and the Lord says, "Okay, you you know tend to my sheep, feed my sheep." Right. So we see this great exchange. We see that the Lord is actually coming down to, "Okay, uh, it's it's this is only so much that you can, you know, you're able to extend." But I'm asking you, even that, can you do? But you know, uh, he's uh, restoring that. Okay. So um, it is difficult. It's not an easy thing to restore trust once when it's broken. Right? But it is possible. And yes, there are certain things that there are certain guidelines, which uh, uh, you know, which are which is there you know, when we deal with other others, and we need to be aware of that. Okay. So um, so the first question is if we if we understand that those whom one is serving are taking advantage of the leader and other people within the group, how does one handle that? Of course. So if one is uh, doing something, so that's that's where the whole aspect of truth uh, in love, right? So we we cannot uh, uh, we cannot forsake truth. When we say that we love someone, when we say that we are demonstrating love, it is always tempered with truth. No, it is not devoid of truth. So, which means that if if uh, it is tempered with truth, it needs to be pointed out. It's need it needs to be shared. Okay, that hey, there is love, there is grace, um, but you share, confront if something is not uh, confront in love and honor. You know, and not in a very un, uh, uh, not in a not Kind of robbing the dignity of the person, you know, breaking the person down in honor to say that you know, this is what we agreed upon and this is not followed. Or, you know, right now you're taking advantage of whatever, you know, opportunities have been given, advantage of whatever grace was extended. You're taking advantage uh, of, you know, of me, of the others. And uh, well, whatever you know, we, of course, we're looking at very generally. But then, you know, whatever was expected of that person is not being done, or that person is doing something which is uh, causing damage, uh, you know, to the group, to the team. So that needs to be pointed out. That needs to be correction, uh, uh, and consequence uh, need uh, correction needs to be done and firmly in love. <coughs> Sorry, and also the consequence of the action. You know, if you continue. The Lord Jesus said that, you know, to the uh, to the person who whom he healed, 
he said uh, you know you repent lest the worst thing befall you right so the consequence has to be communicated saying you know if you continue in this then maybe we, we need to you know we, we cannot continue having you on the team or we cannot continue maybe there is it's a time for you to maybe step out take a break uh, whatever you know that consequence of it has to be spelled out right? that is also love in action okay okay right um, okay so jeffina you have a question yeah go ahead please uh, yes pastor so about yeah. this uh, john chapter 21 uh, where you told like this agape and filial yeah. yeah yeah so does it mean like uh, peter love the lord very less <laughs> because he's asking like do you agape love me mm-hmm. and he's responding like i just love you as a friend if, i mean mm-hmm. if you convert in english and yeah. uh, does it mean like Peter loved him less, and is it okay for the Lord if we love him less? <laughs> mm. So definitely, see, we are we we are on a journey, and Peter also, you know, at that point, Peter definitely responds by saying, using a uh, a word for love, which is definitely less than agape. You know, but agape is the highest, right? uh, unconditional, in spite of everything, that kind of a love. Definitely, Peter here uses phileo, meaning friendship and and companionship and. You know that kind of brotherly love kind of a thing. So, uh, so the, uh, but we also know that he rose up to be a leader. He rose up to be a very sacrificial leader who martyred his love, life, you know, for for the sake of uh, Christ. Right. Uh, in fact, the Lord sees, Jesus says in verse eighteen, uh, John twenty one, most assuredly I say to you, when you were younger, you girded yourself and walked where you wished, but you are old, and when you are old, you will stretch out your hands, and another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish. And this he spoke, signifying by what death he would glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said to him, Follow me. Right. And uh, and then it, it goes on. So uh, well, he came to a place. Where, uh, so we can we can just conclude and say okay he he came to a place uh, you know all our love as as human beings all our love is deficient compared to the love of god but uh, uh, but we also know that uh, you know with the outpouring of the holy spirit um, romans chapter uh, romans chapter 5 right says that the love of god has been poured out into our hearts now we know that this was the lord was with them during this time at the conversation uh, when they had the conversation and then we see that um, uh, romans 5 and verse 5 right so uh, where the love of god is poured out by the spirit of god so well he was filled with the spirit and uh, we can say that yeah the love of god being poured out into his heart by the spirit and uh, yeah and all that changed right so yeah <laughs> yeah uh, i have one more doubt yeah so uh so is it is it right if we say to god i mean if we say to god like i love you with your cup of love <laughs> i mean we can't do it i mean it's the most form of love right uh, so mm. if we say to god like god i love you with the love of a cup is, is it right to say like that or it's not i mean only god can say that to us yeah only god can actually assess that love okay. you know he can uh, he can really evaluate and mm-hmm. we know that love is uh, uh, love is a verb in the sense it's it's in action it's translated in action um, maybe with the choices you make and and every time you make a choice to honor him and say no to you know things of the flesh you're actually demonstrating and saying lord i love you um, uh, in the highest form so yeah so I, it's not wrong to to <laughs> tell him that he love him and uh, you know but, uh, but what would be uh, what would be even more important or uh, you know uh, of value would be the way we live it and uh, of course he would actually evaluate it yeah okay thank you pastor Okay, I think Rosalind wants to say something here. Um, says uh, we humans can never love Jesus with agape love. I guess the highest form of love only God can love us that way. Yes, Rosalind, true. Uh, but also when we look at Romans five and verse five, 
the Bible says that by the Holy Spirit, uh, the love of God has been poured out into our hearts. Right? So we have been recipients, we have become recipients of the God kind of love. Yes, it it's, it's originates from him. He is the source of that love. Um, but the love of God has been poured out into our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. So we are, you know, we are recipient of it. But the problem is this, you know, in our expression of this agape love, uh, because love has to be expressed uh, in our expression of it, there are, you know, varying degrees, right? Because our flesh comes in the way, it's a barrier, and uh, our unrenewed thinking, you know, that comes in the way of expressing this kind of love with to God and, and to people. Yeah. Okay. So, Paul, you have a question? Yes, first I have a question. Yeah. Uh, what does the, the washing of the uh, when Jesus washed the feet of the apostles? What does it mean? Uh, and yeah, he told so, them also to give the same. Does it mean we physically also now wash the the feet of the followers, or what does it mean? Yeah. So uh, it was a physical act that he did, and uh, and when we when we looked at look at the text, we see that yeah. Um, and in that time and culture, this would be done by uh, a servant. So that's why he said it took on the form of a bond servant. And a servant would do that, take off the outer garment and then go about and washing. So in, in the culture and time. So, um, so that is what, uh, so more than the physical, the Lord is saying, this should be your posture. Because right through, he's been saying, you know, if you want to be a leader, you need to be a servant of all. You need to serve. So he's talking about the posture of our heart. And uh, of course, there's nothing wrong in doing it in a literal sense. But in your culture, you know, what is it that uh, that a servant would do? What would demonstrate, you know, uh, this kind of, uh, 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 this, this attitude? Right, in order to serve others, um, so what would what would it mean? So do that, right? So so the, the message is to serve others. Um, there's nothing wrong in doing it literally, and of course it uh, it also conveys a powerful message. And we see it, you know, some people have this foot washing uh, ceremony, uh, maybe as part of a workshop, maybe as part of a you know church service. Or uh, recently, you know, we've seen in uh, in weddings as well, like the husband and wife washing each other's feet, and uh, as soon as they, you know, make that covenant with each other, it's, and it's a beautiful picture symbolizing, uh, and it's it stays with you um, uh, when 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 you see something or when you do something like that. But the most important thing is um, in the daily course of life, right? Okay, the husband and wife, you know, they've made the covenant, they watched, washed each other's feet, and uh, well, it's uh, in, the, in the, you know, maybe they've gone to bed, and then uh, the husband is feeling drowsy and about to sleep, and the wife says, you know, can you, can you get me a glass of water, and it's in the kitchen, so <laughs> to serve, could be to go to the kitchen and get the glass of water rather than saying, you get it yourself, I'm sleepy, right? So maybe they wash the feet of each other. But then at that moment, the little washing of the feet is to go and get that, right? So that would um, that would be the, uh, the actual practical working out of washing of the feet, right? So yeah, um, I hope that helps, Paul. Yeah. Yes, I understand it. Okay. Right. Okay. Any other questions? Um, okay. So we see, um, you know, all these uh, examples, and and also, like we were saying, you know, the trust once broken, uh, yes, it is difficult to rebuild that trust. Uh, it is difficult to rebuild. But it's something because why? Why is it difficult? Because you're always suspicious. You know, is this person uh, going to do me harm? Can this person be trusted? Uh, what is going on in this person's life? You know, what is what is he or she thinking? Um, it's only natural that these thoughts come up, right? Um, but the thing is, uh, we need to 
go beyond that. And and like we were saying, you know, uh, we have to be discerning. Right? We have to be discerning. Let's say it's a it's a big thing that happened, and the person betrayed the trust in a big way. Then we cannot handle directly some very critical functions or critical responsibilities immediately. Let's say somebody swindled money. Okay, somebody in the team swindled money. You know, they took the money that was that not belonged to them. They took it. Now, yes. The scriptural thing to do would be to forgive and to you know forget and to go back, but we need to do it in phases. Right now, we need to make sure that the person doesn't have those tendencies. We need to make sure, you know, practically speaking, because it's uh, maybe the organization's money, it's the people's money, and you know, so on. So we need to make sure we need there need to be some safeguard. Um, maybe there's there's some time given to see whether the person is completely restored, whether the intentions are, you know, why did that person do that? Right? Why did that person do it in the first place? So then comes the whole thing of addressing that, correcting that, and bringing that person, you know, well, has the person been restored? Or is the person still struggling with those kind of temptations? Then putting that person back in that place is actually detrimental to that person. It's, Right, so we need to think of all that, right, um, before we actually put that person in that place again, uh, place of temptation, right? Um, build strength, and then give that person again a good start, so that maybe that person is completely restored, in order to carry it out to the best way possible. Yeah. Okay, so we'll stop here. Uh, take a 10-minute break, and then uh, we'll come back. Thank you.